I'm just aware it's April 1st. And April 1st was actually the anniversary of my first Jukai, 20th anniversary of my first Jukai. And for this occasion, I'm wearing my old black rock suit. I don't know if it's quite visible enough. I'm gonna turn on more lights. Yeah, so um, I've been practicing for 34 years. And since I did my Jukai ceremony 20 years ago on April 1st, 2001, that means I practiced for 14 years before doing Jukai very seriously. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about Jukai and commitment and all the things associated with that. Um, basically, in 1987, I started practicing at ZCLA, Zen Center of Los Angeles, which is our, I guess, our Dharma grandparents, and with my Zumi Roshi. Interestingly enough, Gyoto, now Gyoto Sensei, was there at the time and in residence. The funny thing was not only was he there, but his identical twin brother was also there. So there were two Gyotos. Gyoto was then dualistic. Of course, his brother stopped practicing. And so now Gyoto has achieved unity again, but it was rather confusing because you never knew which Gyoto you were talking to back in those days. They're startlingly, at least at that time, startlingly identical. Um, but so, yeah, Gyoto and I have been Dharma brothers since the start. And uh, I've been practicing something like four years. I had a little break there where I was living on the East Coast for a year. And I would go up to Zen Mountain Monastery. But uh, it was a big place and I didn't get to know Dido well that first, during those first periods that I was up there, Dido Roshi. Um, but then I went to Naropa Institute in the early 90s, I think it was 91, and um, I signed myself up to be John Dido Lurie's student assistant, because if you're in the MFA program, you, I think we were even required to sign up to be uh, a TA to a visiting teacher, and at that time, Dido was there for... Uh, I think three weeks, quite a long time. And those of you who know Dido Roshi know that he can, he could be an intimidating figure. I was definitely intimidated by him at first, but after a few days, the kind of stern Zen master thing wore off. And, you know, we're eating meals together and I'm taking him shopping and driving him around. It just wore off when we started talking. We, we became quite close eventually. Uh, because he kept coming back, and every every time he come back to Naropa, I would um, be his assistant. So uh, I got to know him very well. And also, Shishin Roshi also showed up that first summer, uh, and and did a retreat in Boulder at the house of um, Sumi and Colin Como. I think that's her last name. Um, when we did sessions there for for. Uh, Quite some time, uh, Shishin Roshi was coming in, going from the West Coast, from from San Diego area. But he would come out to lead session and kind of started building a sangha before he eventually moved out here. So I knew him back then too, and as if that wasn't enough, Bernie Roshi, Bernie Glassman, was also uh, frequently in Europa in those days. He was. Um, he was a candidate for the board of Naropa at the time. And when push came to shove, they didn't choose him because they wouldn't go with anyone who wasn't a Trumpite, uh, ultimately, who wasn't studying with, uh, who hadn't studied with Chogim and Trumpa. But he was involved with the board for a while, a while. Maybe he was on the board, but he was hoping to be president. I think he was a candidate for president of Naropa, but they were never at that time gonna hire anybody who hadn't trained with Chogim Trumpa. Anyway, um, Geez, was that ever karma connection with the white plum lineage, huh? So I knew Shishin Roshi all that time and I knew Dido Roshi all that time, but I got very close to Dido from being a student assistant many times. And then even after I graduated and was living down here in Taos, I would go up and assist him when he was there. 
and uh, and I became a student of his at the monastery and spent a lot of periods of residency at Zen Mountain Monastery back east. But I never felt uh, any compulsion to take Jukai for a long time. And uh, it's intriguing to me to look back on why not and how that affected my practice. Of course, I can't really know because they're Unlike Yoda, there weren't two of me. So I couldn't have one of me take Jukai and the other not, and then just see what the difference was. There's only one of me. So, uh, um, but I will tell you uh, that there was something funny happened around Jukai, which is, I don't know, my Zumi Roshi never, he ne I don't remember him saying anything about Jukai or that I should do Jukai or anything. And then by the time I got to the monastery, I already knew Dido. So, I was just kind of treated like one of the residents there, just like anyone else who, who'd been around and who practiced well. And uh, so there was never any pressure to take Jukai there either. And, um, but when I first came to practice, I'd had, I came in part to Zen practice because I had a pretty, I was meditating on my own. Um, and kind of playing around with practice, not knowing what I was doing. And uh, through some act of grace, one day I got a very clear glimpse of um, emptiness and unity for, for uh, lack of a better term, enough that the fear I'd been carrying up to that point had dropped off of me um, quite dramatically. And so when I went to a Zen center, I felt like, well, I belong here, even though I thought it was weird. There were people who looked like Mui there, you know, in the robes and the shaved head and everything. Somehow I'd read a million things about Zen and I'd never, it had never sunk in that there were actual monks in 14th century robes with shaved heads and that there was protocol and that there was, uh, that people bowed and all that stuff went by me. I did a ton of reading on, on, on Zen. All, all of that went by me and somehow the I was only reading for the core of it, I guess. But I, I set that up only to say that that because I'd had an experience uh, before I came to practice that nobody argued with. None of those three, te none of the three teachers I was close to, argued with that experience. Not that anybody, nobody sanctions an experience much. They just don't disabuse you of the notion that something happened <laughs> is really what it is. So you read between the lines, right? Um, for, but for that reason, I thought, well, here I am home and uh, certainly something wonderful is gonna happen again any minute. Something really big and wonderful is gonna happen again in a minute. And, um, and nothing did the first year, nothing did the second year, nothing did the third year, nothing did the fourth year, nothing did the fifth year. Well. Basically, 14 years passed and nothing much new happened. <laughs> and uh, which is not to say that nothing happened at all. I mean, it was, it was very um, empowering practice and I learned a lot, but um, I just expected some wonderful, you know, breakthrough to happen any minute. And uh, of course, we've all, we, anybody who's had, uh, any kind of breakthrough experience knows that it's almost inevitable that the, that the mind will do that. You'll want to repeat it, right? And then you can repeat it. You know, as long as you're, as long as you're thinking something's going to happen, something special is going to happen, nothing special is going to happen, right? You have to forget the self for anything to happen. Um, but nonetheless, it, um, I had a hard time with those first years of se session, probably that whole probably the first 10 years at least, I had a lot of pain. And uh, well, you all know, you all know what the, the uh, barriers are and uh, pain and fatigue and, and uh, lack of concentration and boredom and the whole nine yards. But I would always feel better afterwards. And so I would always sign up for the next session. And then in the middle of the next session, I'd say, oh my God, why did I sign up for this torture? You know, and then I feel better afterwards, and thus it went for ten years. Um, but uh, somehow, I guess I just, you know, the century turned, and it was two thousand one. And interestingly enough, 
in 2001, I made two important commitments, which is I took Jukai finally and I got married. And in both cases, I had the preconception that it wasn't going to make a difference, you know, that I was already in, in the case of marriage, I was already in love with this person. We already had a great relationship. Um, you know, it was, it, I, didn't, I didn't think it was going to change anything. And I think very much it was the same with the precepts, taking the precepts, taking Jukai, which I regarded as becoming a Buddhist fundamental. Um, I didn't think it would make a difference. And in both cases, it really did. Um, to my surprise, in both cases, uh, I guess to cycle back to why I didn't take the precepts. So on the, on the one hand, nobody ever told me, hey, why don't you take the precepts? Nobody was giving me any pressure. And uh, I guess I thought of myself as not really a joining type not much of a joiner, I didn't want to join the club, you know? And uh, I think that goes back to, in, uh, I was about 12 years old and I was a Boy Scout. And you're wondering what one thing has to do with the other, but I was on a bus going to or from my Boy Scout meeting. I might've been 12 or 13. Anyway, I think it was the year that one of the conventions for the presidency was in Miami Beach, which is where I grew up. So I would have been 12 or 13 or something. I can't even remember if it was Republican or Democratic. All I know is a million hippies showed up to protest the, uh, the um, convention. Maybe it was 68. Anyway, um, I remember being on the city bus in my Boy Scout regalia, you know, with my neckerchief and the whole thing and everything. And, and uh, this hippie guy gets on the bus and he looks me up and down and he just starts chewing me out for joining the establishment and for uh, uh, joining a quasi-military cult and, and, uh, and, and for strutting around in this uniform as though I was something special. And uh, I, I do think a lot of it comes to that because I just crumbled, you know, underneath that. And I went home and I took off my uniform and kerchief and ever after when I went to my Boy Scout meetings, I would have normal clothes and I'd carry my garb with me and I would change there and I would change back before I, for, before I came home for fear I would run into another hippie. <laughs> um, but then I became a hippie and that was even worse because you really don't want to join anything that looks authoritarian, right? And so I think I had some of that going on. And also I had this thing you know, when I read Jack Kerouac, it sounded like Zen was going to be utterly free and fun, you know, and, and you know, just complete liberation. And D.T. Suzuki made it seem that way, too. And, and, uh, and, and uh, Alan Watts, and those are the people that we mostly read back in those days, and, and uh, made it just seem like, wow, free and easy religion, no problems, you know, nobody hassles about anything. I was really surprised when I showed up at ZCLA and I thought, wow, we're just, you know, everybody's gonna be chilling out. <laughs> and uh, I used to, uh, I was working at the University of uh, California in Santa Barbara and I would go down to LA for, for um, Zazen kind of retreat weekends, usually every other weekend, that's how I practiced. Um, and I'd come back and everyone else had the same preconception. I'd say, they'd say, where were you? Oh, is it a Zen retreat? Oh, that must be so relaxing. You know, just nod and smile. <laughs> but uh, anyway, another thing is the precepts are the precepts, right? And um, I don't know how many of you have had this notion, but um, I, was a, I was a good hippie. I didn't realize I joined accidentally. I joined the hippie thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I actually had kind of backed into joining something, but uh, not only was there this distrust of anything that looked like authority or hierarchy, but, but like most hippies, I didn't want anybody telling me uh, what I ought to do morally or ethically. And, um, and moreover, when I looked at the precepts, I was, I'm a fairly ethical person anyway. I just, I just mostly am, 
that's a lie, of course, I've just broken a precept. No, I am pretty, <laughs> I am pretty ethical, I am pretty moral, but you know, I, I uh, uh, you know, I was already trying to live um, uh, mindful, aware life and, and uh, to do it well. So I thought, what do I have to do? Where, you know, why take on these precepts? And then, then of course, once I actually did take the precepts in 2001, I did have to stop stealing and killing. That was something to give up. But, um, yeah, no, I, you know, I thought, so why do I need these? But uh, anyway, finally, I just thought, well, you know, I've held out about as long as anybody possibly can. And uh, why not? To me, it was about joining the order. It was about, it was about saying, okay, I guess I'm a Buddhist and moreover, I'm a Zen Buddhist. That's, that's really what it really was that made me want to do Jukai is make a commitment to this way. And I, it's not like after 14 years, I was going to go off and, you know, suddenly um, study Kashmir Shaivism or something, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I was going to stay with this path. So I thought, okay, um, I'll do it. And, um, Incidentally, the koan study that I did in becoming a teacher, um, we go through, I think it's a hundred koans on the precepts and we examine them from the literal, what's called Hinayana, which is not a term we should probably use anymore, uh, but the literal precepts. And then the, from the Mahayana perspective, which is the perspective of compassion and then the Buddhayana, which is the perspective of emptiness. And I really enjoyed that study because it just took the precepts from all the different angles and it included, you know, times you can break them. So that was gonna suit me. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember Dido saying that um, you can break the precepts anytime you want. You just have to be willing to take the karmic consequences. Uh, but, uh, which is, you know, an interesting way to put it. So, uh, you know, when I really got into the precepts, they really spoke to me. And, I, and a lot of people really, I've seen a lot of people really transform from taking on the precepts. Um, maybe it's a little sad, but I've largely seen men change the way they treat women and the way they deal with intoxicants a lot when they come into practice or men treat sexuality to be more broad. Um, but, uh, when they take on the precepts, become more thoughtful about the way they're conducting certain things like that. But, um, well, I first took the precepts with Daito Roshi, and then this is my original, um, this is the original insert, which is, as you can see, it's all torn up from sitting a million sessions with it. And it just wore through and, Let's see, the year I turned 50, I committed to practice with Shishin Roshi to finish my practice with Shishin Roshi. And uh, that's, boy, that's been 14 years now. And um, shortly after I committed to complete my practice with Shishin Roshi, this was still inserted in my old rock so and, and it was uh, falling apart. And I said to Roshi, what should I do? And Dido gave me the Koho name, uh, uh, the Dharma name Koho, which means solitary peak, but it had been so long by then, by the time I took it, that Dido could never remember it. And then everybody was just used to calling me Sean. So it never quite stuck with this Sangha either to call me Koho. And so when I told Shishin the old insert was wearing out, he said, why don't we do another, uh, yeah, another Jukai? So I did another Jukai with Shishin Roshi. And so that meant this insert. <laughs> and it's the same Roksu. Um, thankfully, the same Roksu because it took me a week to sew it at, at, uh, at Zen Mountain Monastery. And uh, so that must have been at least a dozen years ago that I, I redid uh, Jukai with Shishin Roshi and the Sangha. Um, and to just, I wanna hear from all of you, but just to kind of close the loop on this, um, we did the, um, 
we had a week long retreat in which we sewed the original rock shoes and I'd never sewed anything before. And maybe I sewed a patch, a really rough patch on a pair of jeans or something, but that was about it. And my wife, Tanya, gave me some sewing lessons and she was especially concerned that because we were going to be sewing in retreat and sewing on our laps that that I not sew the rock suit to my pants or my robe it, it, we wore robes at the monastery and of course I did do that at one point but it wasn't as bad as this one person who announced at the beginning that um, I I only sewed it in by you know five or six threads before I caught on. So it wasn't a big deal, but there was this one woman who at the beginning, I did Jukai with 11 people at the monastery. And uh, uh, with, with this song, I did it with uh, Sato, Bruce McIntosh. So there were two of us. Um, but there was this one woman who claimed to be a champion sewer. And those of you who've sewn a rock suit, it's really easy to get confused. You've got all these little pieces and, and there's, there's front to back, mirroring issues and 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 you've got some all you've got is a square of fabric right and and a little wooden ring and that's about it you know and 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 then a diagram and the diagram i found pretty indecipherable um thankfully we had a couple monks assigned to help us through the process but this one woman was so sure that she knew how to sew and she was just great at it that um that she sewed and sewed and sewed and she she finished first and she proudly showed it to the monastic who was there. At that point, we were still calling women and men monks. So um, that, uh, then we, tr we try to switch over to calling them monastics because nobody wanted to be called nuns, right? Um, showed it to one of the monastics and who, who promptly pointed out that she'd sewed on half of it backwards. So she had to rip out all the threads and she tried to stay up all night to, to uh, to catch up and re-sew it, but she, she did stay up almost all night and the monastic stayed up with her. Uh, and she got to the morning only to discover she was so burned out that she'd sewed it on backwards again. <laughs> so she had to tear it out again and, uh, and then redo it because um, we had to get the rock suits to, to uh, we had to turn in our rock suits, I think more than 24 hours before the ceremony because uh, because all of this stuff had to be done, right? All of this uh, calligraphy and Dharma names and all that. Anyway, lo and behold, after I did Jukai, there was something about making that commitment to the path that, you know, I've always been such a skeptic and I've continually found my skepticism overturned, but at least Zen is the skeptical path, right? We're, we're allowed to question everything and see for ourselves. That's why I'm here. That's why I started here. Um, that's when my practice started to open up and move again. So it really was, it really made a difference to make, um, to make that commitment, just like it made a really big difference to be married instead of just hanging out and living with someone. So um, yeah, there's, um, I don't even know if it's magic or it changes something within us, or if there are bodhisattvas watching who just like, finally, that guy's got his shit together, you know? <laughs> um, all right, we're going to help them out, you know. Um, I don't really know what, what it was, but that's my practice clicked into place for a second time. And actually practicing with this Sangha really made it click into place because the practice at the monastery was so fierce that I was always a little bit tense. And I could come and practice with this Sangha and relax a little. And... Um, and that really made a lot of difference. I stopped hurting and, uh, and things started to move. So anyway, I'd like to hear from all of you. Anybody have anything to say about your experience with commitment, with the precepts, with avoiding the precepts, with avoiding commitment? 